and welcome to another episode of Adventures in Messaging. I'm Emma Stratton, and today I'm joined by Jeff Beckham, Head of Product Marketing at Mixpanel. Hello, Jeff. Hey, Emma. I'm glad to be here. Yeah, it's so good to have you on the show. Super excited to dig into messaging with you. And let's just start with, you know, my favorite thing to ask product marketers. What is your most controversial belief about messaging? Because I know you've got one. Okay, mine is that sometimes speaking to business value is actually the wrong approach. So let me expand a little. because <laughs> That's I know heresy, <laughs> Jeff, that's heresy. <laughs> In some markets, you're talking to really smart buyers who know their stuff, and it might not be the executive, and it might not be the person responsible for these top-level business metrics. Think about it. Everything in software boils down to increasing revenue or saving money if you really want to go all the way to the top. But then of the thousands of software products, how are they actually differentiated if everyone's actually going up to that level with the messaging? So I'll give you a couple examples from my time and my experience um, so you can see if it passes muster what I'm saying here. <laughs> the one is I used to work in the video conferencing industry. This was five years ago. Keep in mind, it was at a company called Blue Jeans Network. And at that time, we were neck and neck with Zoom. But the incumbent companies were WebEx, GoToMeeting, a bunch of other things. And in the space, anyone who was like, oh, you'll save travel costs or you'll be more productive for meeting remotely, it's like, sure, that is in fact a value, but any of these companies can provide this value. So how are you differentiating? And especially if you're trying to disrupt, I hate the word, but disrupt, <laughs> right? And break in, you're just coming with the same thing that the people already there are using and you have to do something different. So what worked for us in this case was actually more use case marketing, like show, don't tell put the differentiating features, but like put them into real life scenarios so people could get it. And in that case, it was most people hated going on to their meetings and all the hassle of how you had to log on and be on your little computer screen and so close to your laptop and the video doesn't work. And when we would show giant crystal clear video on a conference room TV while sharing your screen, which at that time was really unique, people would be like, oh, wow. I can see how I would remove a headache five times a day when I join meetings. I want to use this. Yeah. Um, yeah. It's hard to think. It's like weird to even think back to that world when that's like a, a big innovation. But it's such an interesting point you make because we are sort of taught like always don't just talk about the features, go to the value, go to the business value, but it depends. It's case by case. Um, so what is that sort of balance and that tension between the differentiation, the features versus the value? So how do you kind of go through that or how do you know how far to go? You know, do you have any thoughts about that? Yeah, well, I think it's, you got to know your audience. Yeah. Who are you talking to and what is their knowledge level? And also, I do want to be clear about one thing. I'm not suggesting marketing pure features and functionality. I think there's a level in between of this top line business value and then the what does it do? Right. Like, why do the features matter? Like, what do they roll up into, into actually helping people accomplish things, right? And so I think there's that sweet spot in the middle. Now, if your business go-to-market model is we sell to CFOs or CMOs, sure, those might be people where it would resonate of save this amount of money because they're responsible for a number like that. But if, if you're marketing to someone more in the middle or practitioner or have a bottoms up model, that's not the stuff that's on their mind. The stuff that's on their mind is it's a hassle how I do this or that today, or if only I had this information today, or I could collaborate in this better way. And then once they start using the product, if it actually delivers, then that does the marketing for you. Yeah. Easy, right? Yeah. <laughs> yeah. I love that. So since we're talking about, you know, burning the rule book and saying controversial things. Let's talk about kind of those classic phrases or the jargon or those terms that you often see in product marketing uh, that need to go, that you can't stand. Let's talk about that. This is a fun one. I'll give you a couple. There's one that's within my industry in the data yeah. world. And then there's one that's broader SaaS. Sure. In the data world, there's this saying that the 360 degree view of your customer. And I feel like <laughs> When I'm browsing the internet, there must be 20 companies using it. And I get the intent of it, but like, really, what does it mean? Because when you see companies in different industries using the same thing, you start to wonder what the meaning is, where you get CRM companies, you got customer data platform companies, you've got um, data warehouse companies, you've got all sorts of different um, messaging companies. So all sorts of different industries using the same thing. And at some point you're like, hey, 
I don't really know what that means in the first place. But then on top of that, now that everyone else is using it, when are we going to move on to something more specific and more meaningful? That happens so often. You think, where did this phrase begin? It's like someone came up with it. Someone else copied it. Suddenly it becomes this phrase that everyone uses as if it's a normal sentence. And it's not, I mean, I think it's like a medical imaging company, right? <laughs> like some kind of new CAT scan, like, you know, scan or something. But yeah, these things become accepted. But when you take a step back and you're like, this doesn't mean anything. I know sometimes like my theory on why does this happen? Cause I ponder this a lot is sometimes we confuse the success of a company with the path they took to get there. Huh. So like, let's say Salesforce puts this cause they are one of the ones that use this message. Well, they're growing super fast. Their messaging must work. Well, maybe they were just first to market and they're a behemoth and everyone knows them and they're the leader in every magic quadrant. And what works for Salesforce isn't going to work for everyone else. That's such a good point because I see that a lot too, especially with earlier stage companies who are thinking about their messaging and they're looking at companies that are either public or way like five years, seven years ahead. And they're like, well, they're messaging that and we're kind of doing the same thing. So that should work. And it's either, Hey, you're not there yet. You don't have that kind of clout behind it. Um, just cause they're doing it. Doesn't mean that these words are going to magically open doors. <laughs> I mean, messaging is important, but there's no kind of magic bullet there. You know? Yeah. So yeah. tell me about the broader tech then. So we don't like 360 degree view. <laughs> tell me some broader tech ones. Yeah. The, you know, the cost as little as a cup of coffee a day. <laughs> yeah. Uh, you know, I can do math. Most people can do math. And so you could just say cost five bucks. Um, but I'm kind of over it, to be honest, and everyone's using it. And then the other one that I see this less often now, but it's so simple, your mom can do it. Yeah. Like, like, my mom's That's, smart. As a mom, like I find that offensive. Yeah. You know? Yeah. Totally. <laughs> oh gosh. Yeah. So um, what else? Any others? Yeah. Well, I have one, but it's actually kind of in the opposite of things I think we shouldn't manage that have been managed. And I believe that sometimes acronyms can be good. Right. Uh, the reason is they can help you relate to your audience in a unique way. And then also saving space. So I'll give you an example, like APIs. If you actually write that out or SDKs, those are two words in, in my world, in data world. If you write those out, the developers you're trying to talk to, be like, what are you talking about? And they might actually not know what the spelled out version is. That would be embarrassing, um, I yeah. think, to spell an API. <laughs> yeah. Um, so I know that's an extreme example, but I think it applies in lots of cases where what we learn in school or coming up in product marketing is don't use acronyms. And like, yeah, you should think about is, is this the right time? But it comes down to, does my audience get this? And if they actually do, you can earn more credibility by just speaking their language because that's their language. Absolutely. And I think you've hit on a really great point is that it is, you should reflect the customer's language and customers are different. So there'll be, you know, different variations, but there aren't these black and white rules, right? No acronyms, always business value, right? There aren't any absolutes like that, that work for every customer and every market. So that's a really good insight. <laughs> Thanks. Okay. So Jeff, tell me, you've been you know, in your career for a while, you've learned a ton of things. So if you could go back in time and give some advice to your younger self or to other kind of up and coming product marketers, what advice would you share? It's do what matters, not what's easy. And it's something that I learned way later in my career than I would have liked to. Um, there's a conversation that I remember of my boss and mentor at an old company. I thought I was killing it in my role as a, you know, three years into my career, product marketing manager. And I'm like, hey, I'm ready for a promotion. Look at all these things I did. He said, Jeff, you're doing awesome work, but you're working on things that don't matter that much. Like they matter, but solve the big problems. And then we'll talk about having a promotion. Like I was churning out tons of solution sheets and data sheets, right? Ebooks. He's like, Here, you know what matters? Get us placed in the Forrester wave. Go <laughs> teach our sales team a new narrative that's going to help us beat that competitor. Like That's what meaningful impact looks like. And I had two feelings after. I was like, wow, he's so right. I'm embarrassed, but also you could have told me this sooner. I wish I knew this. And so <laughs> that's something that I try to live by every day. Like don't get caught up in the riffraff of just output and checklists. Like there's some things you just got to do, but in product marketing, there's always going to be more things you could do because product marketers tend to be versatile, but are you actually focusing on the big problems and carving out time for those? That is such good advice. 
Thank you for sharing that. That advice just is good for life in general, uh, I think, because it is easy, especially, you know, product marketers, they're responsible for so many things and there's endless lists of things to do that you can get lost in those things and you're kind of missing the big picture. So you're kind of inspiring people to not only make better use of their time, but even see a bigger role and a bigger impact, you know, for yourself in that position, which is super cool. So I love that. Awesome. <laughs> <laughs> well, it's been so fun chatting with you. I love all of your radical beliefs and uh, yeah, giving me some things to think about. So thank you so much for being on the show today. Thanks, Emma. It was a pleasure. I enjoyed it too. 